It's good to see you all here today. But you know, when I look out and I see young people, young men, young women, like this young couple over here, and all these young people over here, it makes me feel good. And I want to see more of them here. You know why? You know why? I am getting old now. And I want to see young people in the church to carry it on. I was thinking the other day, I've been in the church for 61 years. And it just seemed like yesterday. It doesn't seem long. But praise God, he has allowed me to remain with him this long, and I have not given up. What's my motto? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. When you get to the end? All right, some people remember my motto, but let me repeat it. For those who have never heard it, like my young friend, the friends here, don't give up, don't give out, don't give in, and when you get to the end of your rope, tie a knot, hang on there. Okay? That's my motto. And I'm not going to give up in spite of what might happen to me, because I want to see Jesus when he comes. My subject this morning is keep on believing. Keep on believing. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, this morning as I come before you, I ask for the Holy Spirit's guidance and protection. Help me, Lord, that as I bring your word to your people, they will receive them, and they will hold on to you and never give up. May the Holy Spirit lead, guide, and direct us now. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Early in the 19th century, the French skeptic Voltaire said, within a hundred years, Christianity would be extinct. It has been nearly 200 years since this prediction was made, and Christianity is still going strong. Even in the Muslim countries, Christianity is growing. Everywhere around the world, Christianity is growing. And when I go into these different foreign countries and preach the gospel, and I see the amount of people coming out to listen to the word of God, they know I'm a Christian. And they're coming out to listen. Oh, what joy comes to me when I see the crowd. This country, America, we thought everybody here would be Christians. But we are so liberal that we allow peddlers of different religions come to this country. And we believe what they are telling us. Keep on believing. In the 1970s, some liberal theologians declare that we have outgrown the Bible. Many such men accept the radical conclusions of rationalistic theologians as proven truth and base all their teachings concerning the Bible on those suppositions. 
To be scholastically acceptable in many theological circles, we must debunk, degrade, and destroy the Bible. Friends, the Bible is God's book. Do you believe it? And therefore, we have to hold on to it. Read it every day. Don't give up. Read it. It has something good in it for you. Our text this morning is staying from 2 Peter 3. 2 Peter chapter 3 and verses 3 through 8. Knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers walking after their own lusts and saying, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. For this they willingly are ignorant of, that by the word of God these heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of the water and in the water, whereby the world that then was, being overflown with water, perished. But the heavens and the earth, which are now by the same word, are kept in store, reserved unto fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. You hear all types of things being said these days. All types of doctrines being preached. But Peter is here saying, don't bother. Jesus is coming soon, my friends. And he wants you to read his word, study them, and keep on believing. And this text reminds us of the scoffers in the last days. That there is a growing despair over the possibility of knowing God. Among the Protestants, radical theologians are causing many to wonder whether religion any longer has a worthwhile mission of its own to the world at large. People are wondering. When we see the happenings of the time, the things that are happening around us, it makes us wonder. The hungering soul seeking the bread of life is served the crust of uncertainty, the bread of doubt. What would you think of a medical doctor prescribing medicine and telling his patient that he is not sure if it will help or how long he should take it? What would you think of him? But one day it might, you might feel better. Would you trust such a doctor? This is the manner in which some theologians treat this, their congregations. Ancient doctrines are under assault as never before. Denominational lines are crumbling. The world of religion is undergoing strange and far-reaching changes. The faith of their fathers no longer satisfies the youth of this generation. The books from the mystic East vie for attention with the Bible in Western lands as gurus and maharajas stream to America to peddle their wares of mysticism. The story is told that in one of our large cities in Europe, the Seventh-day Adventists 
wanted to have a meeting. And so they rented or secured a very large non-Adventist um, church to have their meetings. There were over 2,000 people in the hall or in the, the, the building. And when the, the, the pastor of the church saw the crowd, he came down dressed in his gown and things. And he came to welcome the people for the Adventists. But he kept on talking and talking and talking and talking and wouldn't stop talking. He became so inspired until someone handed him a note reminding him that was not his meeting. It was somebody else's meeting. Why did this happen? You see, he never, as large as the building was, he never seen more than 25 to 30 people each Sunday. But when he came and he saw the crowd, he was so touched that he had to take over. If you go to Europe, you'll find a lot of big churches. But you won't find a lot of people attending them. America is becoming like that, you know. Did you know that America is becoming like that? This morning when Sabbath school started, please don't get mad with me now. Let your eggs and your tomatoes stay in your bags. Okay? But when we started Sabbath school this morning, it was only eight of us. But praise God, you are here. I'm always talking about at Sabbath school attendance. You know why? Being in the church for 61 years, it's the Sabbath school that really helped me. When I went to college and my professors would throw things, they say, How do you know so much? Sabbath school helped me. So let's not give up. Let's not be in despair. Let's keep on believing. No doubt there are varying contributing factors in the diminishing interest among many Christians. Perhaps the word of an unknown observer may reflect one cause. If men get stones when they ask for bread, they will stop going to the bakery. If men get stones, they won't go back to the bakery. And that's why we are saying to our people, study the word of God. Share the word of God. We don't want you to get stones. We want you to get bread. Come to the bakery and get bread. Second Timothy 1, 13 and 14. Let's turn there. Second Timothy chapter 1, 13 and 14 says, Hold fast the form of sound words which thou hast heard of me in faith and love which is in Christ Jesus. That good thing which was co committed unto thee keep by the Holy Ghost which dwelleth in us. Paul here was encouraging them. Hold on. Hold on. Don't give up. Humanism, secularism, 
liberal theology and the new morality have certainly played their subtle role in the diminution of faith in the Christian gospel and interest in today's Christian church. We still believe that a gospel that turns aside from the Bible, substituting man's philosophy and speculations for the certainty of God's word, will persuade few sinners to turn from their sins. If it's not according to the word of God, it's not going to turn you from your sins you will continue doing the same thing. Stealing, drunkenness, and worldliness. will continue in our lives. But when you preach the word of God and tell it to men to turn from their sins, and hold on to Jesus Christ. People will think about it and will give their heart to Jesus. You know, when you go and you preach the word and you see people coming down when you make the call, and people coming down and giving their life to Jesus, it's such a joy you cannot express. And when you look out here and see this place filled with people on the Sabbath preaching, preaching the word will mean something to you. But Jesus wants us to be sincere. He wants us to be faithful. And he wants us to be happy. Are you a happy Christian? Even when you are in pain. Amen. Amen. Have you ever awakened at night and you can hardly move because your side is killing you with pain? Has it ever happened to you? But you have to go back to sleep. Don't give up. Go back to sleep. Don't mind what's happening to us in this world. We are Christians. Jesus Christ is our Lord. He came and he suffered pain for us. And he's coming back to take us home where we won't have any more pains. The song says the theme of the Bible is Jesus and how he came to save men. Do you want to be saved when he comes? Yes. Don't mind what pain you are in. But do you know we have various kinds of pains? Do you know that? We have financial pains. Isn't that true? Oh, thank heavens I'm in a group of people that don't have any financial pains. Amen. Very good. We have Physical pains. Nobody here has any pain. Not even when I see them hopping around two weeks ago or three weeks ago, they didn't have any pain. <laughs> Nobody has emotional pains. When you see your children going the wrong way and you want them to turn to Christ and they will not, that's pain, friends. That's pain. 
But praise God, Jesus said he will come back and take us of our pains. We must take the word of God seriously. When men go to the bakery to get bread and they get stones, they will not want to go back to the bakery. But when he goes to the bakery and he gets the bread he wants, he will go back. Do Seventh-day Adventists still believe the directives of the old way, Mark? Or are we vacillating like some other churches? We still believe the cardinal doctrines of the old way, Mark? I was talking to a lady yesterday. And she agreed with everything I was saying except the Sabbath. And she's going to bring me some proof. Oh, I can't wait to get the proof she's going to bring me. That Sunday is the Sabbath day and not Saturday. I can't wait. Monday morning I will see her because we go to the uh, exercise place there. And I hope I can debunk what she's telling me. But she told me she's going to bring proof to me that Sunday is the Sabbath day. Study the word. Study the word. Study the word. Especially my young people. Oh, I love them so much, I can't express it. I remember when my son and my daughter were growing up, Young, oh, I just love them so much, Reagan. And I want to love you all the same way. When I see you coming to church in Sabbath school, it makes me feel good. And I want to see more young people come in. Do the best you can to bring more young people to the Lord. I still believe that Jesus wants me to save you, help save you. Have you noticed how friendly I am to the young people? You see how the young people are friendly towards me? This is a way of keeping them in the church. Your children are mine. My children are yours. And we must do the best we can to help them to say, stay with the Lord. Seventh-day Adventists believe that God the Father is the eternal creator, source, sustainer, and sovereign of all creation. He is just and holy and merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. The qualities and powers exhibited in the Son and Holy Spirit are also revelations of the Father. That's why I believe in the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost as one Godhead. We have a lot of controversy about this Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. But they are one God. Our everlasting Father. And he is just and holy, merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. And we believe that God, the eternal Son, became incarnate in Jesus Christ. Through him all things were created. And 
and by him we live and dwell in righteousness. We believe that God, the eternal spirit, was active with the Father and the Son in creation, incarnation, and redemption. He filled Christ's life with power. He draws and convicts human beings and those who respond, he renews and transforms into the image of God. We believe that God is creator of all things and has revealed in scripture the authentic account of his creative activity. In six days, the Lord made the heavens and the earth and all living things upon the earth and rested on the seventh day of that first week. Thus he established the Sabbath as a perpetual memorial of his completed creative work. When the world was finished, it was very good. God said it was very good. We believe that man and woman was made in the image of God with individuality, the power and freedom to think and to do. The image of God in them was marred and they became subject to death. We, their descendants, shared this fallen nature and its consequences. For that reason, we are born with the weaknesses and tendencies to evil. But God in Christ reconciled the world to himself and by his spirit restores in penitent mortals the image of their master. We must come to God penitently. He wants us back. We were stolen from him, and he wants us back. And that's why he's saying, come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. The church is one body with many members called from every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. In Christ, we are a new creation. Distinctions of races or culture, learning and nationality, and differences between high and low, rich and poor, male and female, must not be divisive among us. Seventh-day Adventists must believe that all people are God's people. And we must love one another. It don't matter where I am from. <laughs> oh, we have to give an account in the judgment. We better be careful. You know, when I graduated from college, the remark was made, he went to the white man's school. Oh, who cares? I went to Keene. I didn't go to Wokwood. I know he wants a job from us. Hey, aren't we all one God's people? I don't know where the color of the skin came from. I can't tell you. I would be a liar if I tried to tell you. Philip, if I tried to say, the Asians and the Anglos and the Negroes and this, 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 this. I would be lying to you. I know God made man in his own image. He created man, which means mankind. Have you noticed how friendly I am to everybody? I am friendly to everybody. 
I don't care where they're from. Somebody said to me one day, I noticed that you care so much for Filipinos. I said, yeah, because when I came to America first, and I met them in, in, in Dallas, we were working together at the hospital, they were nice people to me. So I, I love them. White people, I love them. Black people, I love them. Why? Asians, they were next door to me. I love them. Cubans, I love them. It doesn't matter who they are. They are God's people, and I love them. Seventh-day Adventists believe that sin is death. God alone is immortal, will grant immortal life to those, to his redeemed, until that day. Death is unconscious. But one day, death is going to die. Do you believe that? We still believe on the new earth in which righteousness dwells. God will provide an eternal home for the redeemed and a per perfect environment for everlasting uh, <clears throat> environment for everlasting life, love, joy, and learning in his presence. For here God himself will dwell with his people, and suffering and death shall have passed away. Death, thou shalt die. If I go to bed tonight and I don't wake up in the morning, I have this hope that burns within my heart. Hope in the coming of the Lord that one day I am going to wake up and I'm going to see Jesus. Death, thou shalt die. You have no power. Jesus has all the power. Each night I go to my bed And I pray, and Lord, if I should die tonight, in the resurrection morning, I want to see you. Make sure you give your heart to Jesus Christ daily, nightly, all the time. And I want to say this to us for encouragement. If somebody step on your toe, it hurts, doesn't it? He might step on your toe unwillingly. He might step on your toe willfully. Forgive him. Forgive him. You know, um, a man is married to a woman. After a while, you see they start fussing and fussing and fussing with each other. They are Christians. Why don't they just forgive each other? Forgiveness is a wonderful thing. And my friends here, they recently got married. 
and I want to encourage them. He is going to step on your toe. And you're going to step on her toes. Hmm. And my young friend over here, friends I should say, you are going to step on each other's toes. It's natural. But forgive the stepping on. Forgive. I've been married for 47 years to the same woman. You think I haven't stepped on her toes? Eh? You think I have not stepped on her toes? <laughs> and do you think she has not stepped on mine? And I pray, I say, Lord, give me patience. That when my toe is stepped on, I'll be able to endure it. The world in which we are living today, my friends, is a confusing world. Have you been listening to the TV this week? You see what's going on? Brother Kincaid, you don't want to be in such condition, would you? <laughs> I tell you, when I was in Dallas, they wanted me to run for an office up there. And I, I was willing at first to do it, but then after thinking about it, I have to go to Sabbath, Saturday night, I mean Friday nights, to hold meetings to collect money for, I said, oh no, that's not for me. Forget it. So I didn't run for that office. But I tell you, my friends, oh God, have mercy on these people. Have mercy on these people. Things happened in the past. 38 years coming back to haunt people. What a miserable, confused world we are in, Philip. Have you ever thought of it? What misery. Many are accused for things they haven't done. And many have done things they're not accused of. But one day, Jesus is coming back. Let us keep believing. And follow in the old way marks. Don't give up your beliefs because your reward is sure. And God shall wipe away all tears from our eyes, according to Revelation 21. And there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying. Neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, prepare us for that grand day when the clouds break and Jesus comes. Help us to be ready, O oh Lord. Give us the peace that we need so we can live a peaceful, gentle life here in Christ Jesus. We thank you for hearing us now. In the holy name of Jesus, I pray. Amen.